Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Mann. Welcome to the Rhinebeck Historical Society meeting on September 24th, 2015. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about the Frost family, um, who were one of Rhinebeck's earlier families, but also important because of the, the uh, Frost Family Fund, which has been so generous to Rhinebeck the past few years. Barbara and Benson Frost, many of you in this room knew in various capacities, social, through church, through different organizations in town. They were descended from a Quaker, William Frost, who came from England, and his wife, Rebecca Wright. And they settled on Oyster Bay. Um, part of the property is what is now known as Sagamore Hill, the home of Teddy Roosevelt, which is quite a large settlement in itself. Um, the Wrights are probably one of the largest of the Long Island families who came here from England. Uh, the Frosts really were not one of the bigger families of what is now Nassau County. Um, Oyster Bay at that time was considered Queens, which is really interesting. So you got to think colonial New York before the division of the counties um, down on Long Island, and that basically everything from Brooklyn, east of Brooklyn, was just considered Queens. <laughs> um, which is some of the most beautiful land in New York State. Uh, the Mayflower connections to, this, to the Frost is really fascinating. Most of the people, when you talk about the early Quakers, claim to be descended from John Halland and Elizabeth Tilly. The Hallands were a gigantic family um, that settled at Plymouth. But Barbara and Benson were descended from Elizabeth Tilly's uh, Howland's brother, Stephen Tilly. And we don't really have all the information on Stephen Tilly. Um, his de uh, descendant from whom the Frosts are descended was a woman named Rose Springer, <coughs> whose um, grandfather was, her great grandfather was a Stephen <coughs> Tilly. Um, Benson and Barbara's parents. Um, were Benson Frost Sr., who was also an attorney, um, as was his son, Benson Jr., and Elizabeth McRusty. Uh, the McRustys are an old family of Scotch descent who settled near Ogdensburg in upstate New York, and many of them were school teachers. One of the things that Barbara had said to me um, when she and I were working on this genealogy about seven or eight years ago was her mother could never get into the Mayflower Society on the McRusty line, and it always bothered her. And she had all these records, many letters. She had written National DAR. She had written other national organizations based out of Washington, D.C. that were dealing with genealogy, and also up in Boston area, the New England Genealogical <coughs> Society. And they could not come up with the official connection to the Mayflower. And as we know now, everything's on computer, things are much more accessible, we find that they actually were descended from John Aldrin and Priscilla Mullins. Um, and it was through a family up near Augensburg called Wells, from whom um, Elizabeth McRusty was descended. And there's hundreds of Wells out of that lineage. And they're not the same Wells necessarily from Long Island, which is also another large family down there. So it gets very confusing in dealing with that, but um, how smart of Barbara's mother to keep carbon copies of letters that she was sending all over the country trying to connect with these cousins um, and these organizations, and we have all of that. And we actually have one woman in Florida who recently became a member of the DAR through the Wells lineage, and it was because of those letters. There was one document she could not find anywhere that was proven and certified through a notary public from Barbara's mother. Oh, so I mean, even in death, these people are still helping other people. And I think with their foundation that, um, here in Rhinebeck, that's just another example of how they really did dedicate their lives to philanthropy for at least three generations, which I find amazing. When the Frost came upstate uh, from Long Island, which was around the time of the Revolution, maybe a little bit, about 10 years, <clears throat> give or take, before, uh, they ended up at Crum Elbow, which is really the east end of Hyde Park. Um, one of the connections they make very strongly with Hyde Park is the Crum Elbow Meeting House on Quaker Lane, um, which 
is opened once a year so that it maintains its nonprofit status. It is not an active meeting. Um, it hasn't been an active meeting probably for about 125 years. It was one of the early meetings that ceased and was taken over by nine partners out of Millbrook. There were so few Quakers left, they only needed one meeting house basically for the east end of the county, and then Poughkeepsie served the lower end of the county. Um, at Fraud, at uh, Crumb Elbow, the ancestor that Barbara was telling me about was Zophar Frost. Zophar is a very unusual name. If you go to get Zophar Frost on the computer, you'll find all sorts of interesting information. And Zophar Frost came up from Long Island and settled at uh, Crumb Elbow. And one of the, Barbara said she remembers being about eight years old and on like a, what they used to call Decoration Day, we now refer to as Memorial Day, one of the elderly aunts <laughs> took her down to Hyde Park, probably in a Model T or something not too much more modern than that, and took her to the Crumb Elbow Cemetery. And there's several parts of the cemetery. You have a very new section to the north end of the meeting house, which is still used. You have the old Quaker families on the south end of the meeting house. And then right behind the east wall of the meeting house, there are these extremely old, very simple little uh, gravestones that go from a little bigger than a brick. Some of them are about that high brown stone. They're very colonial, very simple, which is what the Quakers used till about the time of the Civil War. Most Quakers believed a fancy headstone was vanity, so you did not use that. Um, and all that we know, she pointed to the, that the grave was right outside the wall, but because of lawnmowers, the cemetery has moved the stones. So we don't know exactly where. We just know from Barbara's recollection, it was right outside the east wall that the heads practically touched the meeting house, which will lead me to believe that the Frosts were probably very active in that meeting, maybe even been elders, but all the records burned in the 1840s. So um, I've talked to uh, Christopher um, Densmore, is head of the Friends Library which is a national clearinghouse of primary source documents at, um, oh, the college Swarthmore. there, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. It's the home of the artist Benjamin West that was turned into a college campus. And I said to him, do you have anything on Crumb Elbow? The only thing that's on Crumb Elbow, if you look at Henshaw, which is a very highly regarded uh, record book, and it kind of has notations of births, deaths and marriages in the local Quaker meeting houses, Crumb Elbow gets barely a mention because the records really only start from around the time of the Civil War till about when the meeting house closed or, um, before 1900. So the records are just not there. Uh, the cemetery records, they're kept by a family. There's a family that basically is running the cemetery and actually they do a very nice job their ancestors are buried in that cemetery. They're from Pleasant Valley. And I talked to them, and they have the maps, and they have some of the deeds. But there are certain sections they can't dig in because of the unmarked graves. Some of the Quakers were so orthodox from that meeting house, they didn't even have a marker. They never had any marker to indicate where they were buried. And the maps over the years have changed, been copied to more modern maps, uh, handwritten, so we really don't know. But one of the things I brought tonight, which I find fascinating, this really should have been given, taken down to Swarthmore College, but I kept it here in Rhinebeck. <laughs> Barbara said, do get these to where you think the most people will use them. I was hesitant at that point to take anything to um, the college, Swarthmore, so we kept it here in Rhinebeck. It's a 1752 deed, and it talks about land at Crumb Elbow. It talks about the meeting house. It mentioned, it's signed by a Samuel... Cornell, who was um, an elder in that meeting, and I've had, it's signed by Jonathan Reynolds. I can't tell you how many emails and phone calls over the years I've had from this Reynolds family from Connecticut trying to trace this Jonathan Reynolds. They said, where can we find his gravestone? I said, there's no gravestone. He's probably at Crumb Elbow in an unmarked grave. And they said, well, no, he was wealthy and all that. I said, the Orthodox Quakers didn't really want stones. They just buried you. And you didn't have family plots. Whoever died next was buried next to you. You know, it's very much like the Kipsey Rose Cemetery. We have that section down there. We call it the single grave plots. And it's basically whoever comes in next, you're put there. 
So, but this is a great, and the handwriting is beautiful, it's very readable, and it's quite an important document. Some of the other things that I brought tonight, and then I'll get back to a little more information. A handwritten will from Benjamin Frost. Beautiful handwriting, and it's, I can't remember the date on this, um, 1836. It is, part of it is a form, but most of it is a handwritten document. And these are great for genealogical research. It really pinpoint, pinpoints what children were alive at that point. Sometimes the records are not that good. And we have a bunch of deeds from some of the different families that I'll talk about at the end. So Zophar Frost had his son, uh, Samuel. And Samuel is the one who basically was the progenitor of the Wharton, what I call the Wurttemberg Frosts. He married Barbara Traver. And that was Barbara Frost's namesake, her great-great-great-great-great-grandmother, uh, great-grandmother, excuse me. Um, she and I used to discuss, you know, why do you think they moved to Wurttemberg instead of staying at Frost Mills? One of the things I believe, and we, you know, you can tell it from the, going through the documents, the Travers had so much influence at Wurttemberg and had so much land at that point, they re he really would have been stupid to stay where he was. <laughs> the wife really must have come with a decent dowry. Mm -hmm. Probably land, uh, probably silver. She was obviously part of the, um, the will of her father. So all this kind of comes together and kind of leads into how these two very different families function. And also, we know that basically the Lutherans have always controlled Wurttemberg. Mm -hmm. It was their settlement for many years. They had school ha schoolhouses there. They had a post office at one time, according to Reverend Isaacs. They had the beautiful church that was originally, uh, the old church was down by the trooper barracks. So they really settled there, and it was really, it made sense. Because all the families out in Wurttemberg, basically the Cookinghams, the Marquats, the Frost, the Travers, they're all related. They're all what we call extended cousins. And as Ada Harrison used to say, if you've lived in Rhinebeck for three generations, you would probably somehow have Traver blood in you. <laughs> Don't talk about anyone, in other words, she used to say. <laughs> um, Samuel had a son, Mandeville. And Mandeville is the one that most of the information in the collection focuses on. He would be Barbara and Benson's grandfather. He'd be the father of Benson Frost Sr. One of the things that I found interesting, Mandeville not only taught, or excuse me, not only graduated from DeGarmo Institute on Livingston Street here in Rhinebeck, he also taught at DeGarmo. And we're finding out more and more Rhinebeck residents taught at DeGarmo. Helen Delaport from the Reed family taught at DeGarmo. Uh, Henny Free, who was also a student at DeGarmo, ended up teaching there. So DeGarmo hired a lot of their alumni to come back and teach the next group. And when they moved out of Rhinebeck, some of the local Rhinebeck teachers who were working at DeGarmo went to Fishkill, where um, they, re they retained the second campus at, for the DeGarmo Institute. So not only did he teach at DeGarmo, then we find from some of the schoolwork that we were given from Barbara, from her grandfather, that he also taught at, at Clinton, right near Ziffelberg, there must have been another schoolhouse, which is very close to Frost Road, where the family farm was. And it, the names that are on the schoolwork are also very interesting because basically it's a good part of the Wartenberg Cemetery residence, for lack of a better phrase. The Cookinghams, the Schultzes, the Travers, the Hermances, all those typical Wartenberg families that we always think, I always thought, must have gone to Wartenberg school. Apparently some of them, because they were right on that line, went to Clinton, where there was a schoolhouse, and where Mandeville taught. And some of these documents, two of the documents here, um, are actual schoolwork. One is from Oscar E. Cookingham, who wrote an essay on chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> the topics are very varied. It's quite interesting. Then there's an Alvaretta Traver, who wrote on time. 
dated April 1st, 1868. Mm -hmm. So Albertina. No, this is different. Oh, Albert really? Yeah, this is Alvaretta. I remember Albertina. She was still she, I've, right. I've got a story about She her. was the librarian here in town. But this is an Alvaretta Traver who maybe was an aunt. Gotcha. And he, um, in 1868, was one of the students of Mandeville Frost at that low school out in Clinton. And then we have here something that Mandeville wrote, and it's dated 1862, District Number 3. So we'd have to go back to an old Clinton map and see where District 3 was, but I bet you it was near Ziffelberg Road somewhere off that way, or maybe uh, Pumpkin Lane. But he writes in 1862 about winter. So he was assigning essays, and probably this winter is probably part of a lesson plan that he was teaching the students about the four seasons, would be my guess. Another thing we found in the collection, which um, I thought was fascinating, there were about a dozen Civil War letters. Now, Mandeville Frost, coming from a Quaker family, probably would have been a conscientious objector. Because we can't, there's no mention of him serving in the Civil War. All we have are letters from distant cousins. One of them is a Bullis, from out in Stanfordville, from Bullis Hall, which is a very well-known colonial building out there. And he goes on and talks about the battles that he saw. Um, he's fascinated with the black people because there were probably, even back then, very few in Rhinebeck, would be my guess. Um, and he talks about their mannerisms. He talks about a few of them actually serving with the troops. which he um, And it talks about going down south, Alabama and Mississippi, and seeing the destruction. But how old would he have been in 1862? Mandeville probably been about 18 to 20. Oh, really? That old? Yeah. Because he died, what, around 1930s, I believe, if my memory's right, maybe early 40s. So he would have been probably about 85 when he died. So if you take that back, and probably about 18 to 20. Because the way the letters are written, it shows that he had a maturity level, a, probably a college-educated mm -hmm. person or someone in college. Uh, the, the way they're written, they're written to him directly. Not to his parents or grandparents, not to the aunts or uncles, they're all to him, which I find very interesting. And they talk, um, the, some of the other letters also, they talk a great deal about the Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, they talk about destruction down south. And they talk about, in a couple of them, they mention Rhinebeck <coughs> soldiers that were injured or killed or ended up staying down south. So it's a great little collection. Another thing we know about Mandeville, he was town supervisor of Rhinebeck, and a very active one. Um, he was on, as a result, the County Board of Supervisors for Dutchess County. He was what I would call a gentleman farmer because he had so many other pursuits. He really was not what we would call a dirt farmer. And that's not a derogatory term, but it is what they refer to more as farmers who really do farm, they do the whole vigorous thing. They're not just having a few cows and you know enough to feed the family. They're actually going out there and providing for the locals. Um, some of the uh, local supermarkets or um, dry goods stores would be buying from them. Um, and then the last occupation he takes up around 1912, I believe, 1914, even earlier, 1904, He's growing violets. And I remember Barbara saying he grew violets to educate the twins. Now, your great grandmother, or grandmother, who lived to be so elderly, Adele. she would have been one of the twins, right? No. no. Who were the twins? I think the twins were Leona and. Um Okay. They had different names, yeah, yeah they're yes. not common names, right. which is one of the mm -hmm. things that makes it hard for me sometimes to remember too. But apparently he grew these violets to educate the twins, is what Barbara had said. Now maybe she's a generation off or a few years off with who that would have been, 
But 1904, he's growing violets, apparently to put the two girls through what we used to call teacher school at Newpots, the normal school. Um, and we actually have almost all the receipts for when he built the violet house. We know he went to Herrick for certain lumber. We know he went to the Violet Association to get manure and fertilizers. So it's kind of interesting. You actually could take a calendar and mark on it for that year where he went, what he spent, and how long it took him, which I think was about 45 days to put up the Violet House. Where was it? Uh, right at the, well, that's a good question. I was told, again by Barbara, that the Violet House was in the little, right next door, or almost in back of, the little house where Tom Frost, who recently died, where Tom's parents lived. The bungalow? We, yes, the bungalow. <laughs> It was apparently right attached almost to the bungalow. Interesting. A lot of times they were um, the, the stoke house for the violet, and then they made them to a residence. Oh, oh okay. Was I, that on the west side of the, what's now um, the highway? Well, when you're going at the corner of where the cemetery ends and where Frost Road begins, you would go east on Frost Road. It would be almost diagonal from the big Victorian farmhouse that was the Frost Farm. So it's across the street, actually on the south side of Frost Road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the little ha the bungalow is still there. I, no. no? No. Okay, that's a different house that was put up then right next door to it? The house that's in the front on the corner was Austin's house. Austin's okay, house. thank you, okay. And the bungalow was between the big house and Austin's house. Gotcha, Austin's house. okay. Because I was talking, one of the Frosts were t was telling me he remembered growing up the land being very fertile. And it was, and there were no violet houses yeah. at that time. So probably what usually happened when you took down a violet house, you would literally just dump the trays. Mm -hmm. And you'd probably have very good growing land mm -hmm. for a patch for peas or corn, any of those oh, vegetables. So, <laughs> um, so he was a violet grower for a few years. Mm -hmm. And we know that during World War I in particular, the violets were really popular. Rhinebeck couldn't grow enough violets for Chicago, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, Buffalo. Those were the main ports taking in the violets. Um, they would be thrown on the train, and by the next day, they'd be at their destination. And um, so that, that was another avocation that he had. Now, to talk about Benson Frost Sr. and his wife Elizabeth McRusty, we know that Benson Sr. was a lawyer. One of the things he's probably best known for is being a very close confidant to FDR. FDR would be seen with his security detail at the house. Um, and I believe, and Diane, correct me if I'm wrong, that Tom Frost's father was security for FDR? Okay. Yeah, well, he was, he was in the Secret Service. I don't know if it was for FDR. <clears throat> Barbara seem to remember him coming to the house and being outside when FDR came a couple of times. <laughs> and she also remembered that he was buried at Arlington National, which was very yeah. Yeah. interesting. Yeah. Benson Jr. and a couple of people from the family went down. I guess there were only about six people there, which she always found very ironic because I guess Tom's father was very well known, very dapper, very stylish in Rhinebeck, known by a lot of people. And here he had this very almost reclusive type of a funeral and he died with He'd been, any... He'd been gone a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she probably would have been maybe just starting teaching by then, because it would have been in the early 40s, I believe, or late 40s. Did Mandible die? Oh, yeah. no, he died in the like, 60s. Yeah. Late 60s? Okay. I, I, some, I mean, it was when I was a teacher. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the other thing about FDR and the connection with the Frost, Benson Frost Sr. was very active with the Dutchess County Democrats, because his father was a Democrat. So the FDR coming up to Rhinebeck to try to get the Northern Duchess vote, which he really never <laughs> carried in Northern Duchess County, we all know. Um, and also they were connected with the Duchess County Fairgrounds. FDR used to make a big deal about letting his kids show their horses at the fair. Mm -hmm. And we have quite a few pictures of FDR with Benson Sr. Um, at the fairgrounds. 
and that Elizabeth McRusty was very involved, not only, of course, raising her family, uh, she was for many, many years with the Daughters of the American Revolution chapter here in Rhinebeck. Um, at one point, house chair, and I think at one point, registrar. Um, what else? They were very active with what was then just starting Northern Duchess Hospital, the Rhinebeck Hospital. Benson Frost Sr took over more of the family philanthropy, really, than Barbara. Barbara was in the background and certainly got her point across to Benson <laughs> what she wanted to uh, support. Uh, many organizations benef benefacted actually more from Barbara than from Benson. Benson would support the hospital. Barbara basically tried to do everyone else and make it an equal opportunity. Uh, took it with the museum and uh, the local churches. Um, the family lived in their home on Chestnut Street, and a lot of people think they built that house. They did not. They were the second owners of that house, and I just want to make that very clear, it's, and it's for sale right now. Uh, Barbara was a librarian at Mount Kisco. She started her career the western part of the state and for many years served Mount Kisco Central Schools, and when her mother became ill, she would come home every weekend to take care of her mother and give the help in the house and give um, her brother some opportunity to go out in the community and do what he wanted to do. A lot of people have asked me, well, you're, you talk about the Frost family, you talk about Wurmberg, what are some of the other names associated with the family? Well, one of the more well-known uh, families, the Hawleys and the Winnies, are certainly cousins of the Frost family. And also the Thorns out in uh, Millbrook. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It goes way back to Hannah Thorne <laughs> around, the, around the time of even before they came up here, they were related to the Thorns. Oh. And the Thorns are also part of the Howland legacy. So you have a lot of distant cousins. <laughs> and this is what happens in Quaker family. They are supposed to marry within the faith. And it's not unusual to marry your fourth or fifth cousin. Back, back then, it was also not unusual for the Huguenots to marry their fourth or fifth cousins, because there were fewer people around to choose from. Um, <laughs> They always held a very close connection to part of the Ackert family. The what? Ackert. Um, Mandeville had an older daughter. Uh, we don't know if it was from her first wife. We don't know the information. We have no information. We have this beautiful picture at the museum of a young woman who died in her late 20s, early 30s. She had a son who became very well known in Poughkeepsie as Dr. Ackert on the north end of Poughkeepsie. And this picture was given to us with the caveat not to be shown while Barbara was alive. Mm -hmm. It was. Now a, I thought you had Samuel Frost named on that picture. That was a different picture. Those were the two ovals. But then there was also Louisa. And Louise. Oh, you're right. Excuse me. Louisa was um, Mandeville's sister, brother, sister rather. When and this is interesting. According to Barbara, it gets very confusing. According to Barbara. When Louisa Frost Acker passed away, Mandeville funded the child's life, basically. Sent the child to college, set the child up in his medical practice, and we have a little bit of documentation. We have this very special picture of the Acker, Dr. Acker, and on the back is inscribed, basically it says, to grandpa. And we consider that from the Frost records. The picture of Louisa and the picture of Dr. Frost is probably one of the most important pieces because we can't piece anything else together except that he, was, he had this sister, his father had it from another relationship, and that Mandeville basically raised this nephew. Dr. So it wasn't Packer. Mandeville's child? No, and I'm, I'm sorry, it was Samuel's child, but Mandeville's sister. And he always kind of took care of the sister. I guess her husband died very young, even before she did. Uh, Barbara seemed to think there might have been a flu epidemic at the time because they died rather close together. And they were both very young. And I thought you had told me the one time that he was raised with, with Benson. Benson Sr. Right. And, and this I Dr. Acker. I never Packard. heard about this man. None of us, none of, none our, of our generation, generation. 
bizarre. It is bizarre. <laughs> but we have the picture, and we, no, have, we have a couple of letters. <laughs> it's something that we were told not to talk about until a later date. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads me to believe that why, I mean, if it, so you think that his sister... Was illegitimate. Okay. Mm -hmm. The sister was illegitimate, or she had an illegitimate child? No, the sister was illegitimate. Apparently, before he, before Samuel married Barbara Traver, there was someone else, and he had this daughter. Okay. And she would have been about a year or two older than me. You don't know the mother? No. no. Who did the child live with? Good question. We don't know that either. We don't really know, except in looking through the Wurttemberg records, there's kind of a church census that was done at one point. And it mentions him living with an Ackard over on Burger Road. So somehow he was living with his father's family, at least when he was about 10 to 14. But he was, his last name was Ackard. Yes. And he was actually a very well-known doctor. I guess he was associated with Vassar Hospital, had a practice on the north end of Poughkeepsie. But he, didn't somebody go up to Sarant to screw in Lake or something and die there? That I don't know. Okay, I thought you had to that. <clears throat> Mm, okay, if it was, that's probably on the McRusty side. Okay. Okay. And that might have been, Elizabeth McRusty <laughs> had some brothers and sisters, um, and I think one of them died at school, and that's probably okay. the side of the family that I was talking about. Uh, the Burgers, there's a lot of mm -hmm. outward connection with the Burgers from Burger Road and Burger Hill area. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's connection with... Um, the Kloss family, the Kuhn family, they've all intermarried, which is what happens when you belong to a small community. No, <laughs> when you belong to a small community and you're part of a very active church, chances are you're going to marry within that church. So this is what happens. Another thing I just want to mention, one of the things that Barbara was so good about was the oral history of Rhinebeck. And she was telling me about the sheds that a lot of people remember out at Wurttemberg. Um, it would, the sheds would be as you're coming up toward the church from 9G, you would take a left off 9G, go up the road. On the right hand side where the little field is, I guess is where the sheds were located. They were on either they're side. Both sides, okay. Right. Fran Kilmer remembered them being taken down around 1971, 1970. Does that sound right to anyone? Maybe in 1969. They, they were up in the 60s, yeah. They we, were used, but they were yeah, still. we found records that there was an actual shed association. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And when you died, it was an asset that you left to one of the children or a favorite nephew. <laughs> and um, apparently the Frost membership in the shed association did go uh, three generations. So the sheds must have been up for quite a while. They put the wagons in there, the carriages in there when they went to church. Yes, and Barbara also said there were some people that in the winter would rent other people's sheds and put their farm equipment in so it didn't rust out and get all corroded during the winter if you didn't have room in your barn by the time you got all your hay and all your corn and whatever grains you grew uh, in and the animals. Often you would have to depend on other storage. So that was also used basically as farm storage. Um, I do want to mention a little bit about the Marquats very quickly. There's a lot of Marquats that were out in Wartburg, and then there were the Marquats that were at the village, who had a bakery at one time. Um, one of the things we found in Barbara's papers were the bylaws and regulations of Rhinebeck Cemetery Association from 1908. At that point, there were no frosts in the, the Rhinebeck Cemetery, so I'm assuming something like this is probably more from the Marquat side of the family. Sometimes we got to use these assumptions to try to figure out what's the connection with this thing because we knew if they didn't have plots in the village cemetery. A letter from Benson Frost to the very well-known local resident William Seabrook was one of the things I found that I have here for you to look at. And a very nice letter from 1934 to Dear Ben from Franklin Roosevelt. So it's little things like that that were kept that really are treasures for our local history. And I think I'm going to just say it was a privilege for me to get to know Barbara during a very short time because my friend Joan Hull and she had a lot of Quaker relatives in common and helped me with a genealogy project I was working on for her. And it was just uh, 
she was a very special person. I never knew Mr. Benson for us, but I can tell you Barbara was one of the great caretakers of our history, and we're very thankful to her for what she provided us with. And now I'll take questions. Diane, you might have a couple. <laughs> no, I, I just regret that I didn't find out more from her, because she was, she was such a wealth of information and would love to talk about it, and I should have paid more attention. <laughs> I think we've all been guilty yeah. of that with a relative over the years, right? Um, There's so many things that have come up that I'm like, oh, Barbara was still here. <laughs> you know, it, it was, we were very lucky. Ada Harrison, who was a president of our museum for, and our a founder and our curator, basically was responsible for getting Barbara's trust to hand over this collection to the museum. And, I've used it in so many exhibits, different things in the violet industry, FDR connections. When we did the Wurtenberg exhibit, it was almost all Barbara's papers. It's been a real pleasure to work with this, and I'm hoping in the next year or two to really get together some sort of a catalog of the collection that also has some photographs, mm -hmm. because it really is, I feel, the most composite look we have of any Rhinebeck family, of any collection we've been given. This probably raises the gamut between the United States president, the Civil War, colonial Dutchess County history. It's just been really great to work with. Stephen, do you, are you familiar with any other Quaker families that were in the Wurttemberg area? There was one that came from Chappaqua, the Carpenters. Um, there weren't many of them because most of them stayed down at Chappaqua, but a couple of the farms were flooded when they put in the Mount Kisco in the reservoir. And the, they lived right on the line out at um, Bullshead. Okay. They were part of the Bullshead meeting, and the descendant actually is the one that put up that new building at um, oh, Oakwood, Collins Hall. The Collins family are carpenters, and they're Orthodox Quakers. Um, the other Quaker family is, of course, the Sands family. Um, Jim Cater is a Sands descendant. His family were very early Quakers, some of them. Some of them were Presbyterian at Sands Point on Long Island. Some of them were Quaker. Um, other than that, I've tried really hard to track the Quakers in Rhinebeck. There aren't many that came north of Hyde Park. It's really quite interesting. Until you get to Hudson, and they came for the whaling, mm -hmm. it's like a whole area. There aren't any big Quaker tracts of land or anything that we can find Dutchess County mm -hmm. north or southern Columbia County, you know, south of Hudson. It's really, I find it quite odd that the, the migration just stopped. And even over in Ulster County, they didn't get further north than Milton. They got a little west to Platykill, right outside of New Paltz, and then they stopped. And it's really, I, one of the reasons I was given from the late Greene County historian Ray Beecher was he felt because most of them didn't serve in the revolution, they didn't get land grants. And that was the land that was being developed was more up this way. Even though it was old land, apparently there were some lots that were given out, you know, as rewards. Small lots. I mean, we're not talking tracks like in um, Orange County, but apparently there were some small uh, lots like with the Ostrander family, even though they were loyalists. One of them ended up getting a, a couple small land grants around here. Uh, any other questions? Yes? I remember one time in the cemetery with you that you talked about the Griggs family being Quakers. They were Quaker, but when they came here, they were already changed from being Quaker. They had left the meeting. <laughs> Um, I was really trying to think more of active Quakers. The Baum family is another one, but they were, were Episcopalian by the time they got up here because they had founded that church down in Brooklyn on Flatbush Avenue. I think it's St. Anne's or St. Thomas's Episcopal Church. So really, after the Revolution, maybe people were turned off by the Quakers not participating in the fight, but their membership fell, particularly Ulster County. Yes, Don? Uh, is, is Mandeville a family name? That, uh, no. No. Because I, I, when I was a boy, I lived in Morris County, New Jersey for about 10 years growing up, and there were a lot of Mandevilles down in that area. As a last name. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. There's a big Mandeville family apparently out of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if there was ever with the early Quaker part of the family, but I've gone through um, 
Josephine Frost's book with a fine tooth comb, I couldn't find another Mandeville's, mm -hmm. which I thought was very interesting because it sounds like a very English mm -hmm. proper old first name, but not in that family line. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to thank Stephen for coming tonight and giving us a great talk about the first family. <laughs>